<laughs> Hope you enjoyed that, kids, because Jordy's out of here for the summer. In the meantime, we'll be playing... Ugh, classic Jordy's. Enjoy! <laughs> Christina Keneally, thank you for joining us on The Net. It's so good to be here. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I'd rather be in government, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you basically are. Come on, like, at least this is role play, isn't it? You can pretend you are. Well, I am in parliament, so, you know. It's, it's very close. It's, well, yes, but yet yeah, quite far. We're not, we're the opposition, so... Yeah. Look Not forward to changing that. Though, is it? Yeah. Um, well, it's a different kettle of fish. Federal Parliament and State Parliament are quite different. So. Yeah. Learn something new every day. You do. They're 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 it's quite different, different. Stuff happens there. They I are. Didn't know that. It's amazing. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> I did know that. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's why you are where you are. I wouldn't want your job. I reckon it'd just be really stressful all the time. But. No. 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 I think there's something quite rewarding in you know being part of the system where you make big decisions that affect people's lives directly and you know if you get it right their lives are improved and the country's improved but That's if you quite get rewarding. it wrong it's like being a surgeon but on a national scale <laughs> well i mean you're right there is a lot of risk you know in what politicians do but there's great reward and i i you know having done this now for almost 20 years i do think that the uh rewards far outweigh any of the risks. Yeah. Well, that's your opinion. I still like, dude, I just don't want that. I don't want that much scrutiny on me that it's just like Christina Keneally said and when she probably should have said also to be more grammatically correct. <laughs> Actually, you know, my favorite headline about me is, <laughs> out of all the headlines yeah. that have been written about me, <laughs> Premier Keneally wears the same dress twice. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know about you, most people I know wear their clothes more than once. But this was a headline in the um, Daily Telegraph. Did it go into detail? It did well go into extreme detail. It described the dress, it had the photos, it had the yeah. two events Exposed. where I wore it. It, it. it had the fact that I wore the same shoes with the dress, you know, as if that was somehow made it even worse. Wow. And so that yeah. wasn't even in Sydney Confidential. That was just that front was a, page. That was a, news, that was yeah. a newspaper <laughs> yeah. story, yes. Right. Well, it's good to see that they have a long tradition of great journalism. Mm, um, big issues. Yeah. The other thing i just got to say, well, just before we get into the meaty part of it, I guess, is like, for two, come on, can we have more than two flags in here? It's no. not a Tony Abbott event. It's a, it's yeah, a, it's but why not? <laughs> he set the precedent and you're yeah, cutting it back. Well, uh, does, does this interview really merit more than two flags? Yeah, well, that's okay. Well, thanks. All right. <laughs> it's no come back to that. Um, I guess we'll just uh, move on to the actual question, Gene. Uh, what, uh, what blowback did you get for the old migration fiasco? Was it, was it actually that big or was it kind of just like the press made a big issue of it? What fiasco? Well, because I just read your opinion piece and basically... Oh, the it opinion like, piece? Yeah. Right. It just seemed like everyone went nuts. Because you said we should protect Australian workers, mm. which, wow, scandal. I didn't realise the government was supposed to do that. <laughs> also, you know, is in the Australian Labor Party platform. <laughs> that that's yeah. what, you know, yeah, we yeah, were yeah. running. I would imagine a Labor Party would mm. be interested in protecting Labor. Well, they are. Yeah. They are indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you well, know. Just to set the record straight. <laughs> to be clear about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, I, you know, the, the migration program has to operate in the national interest, right? And, you know, one of the key parts of the national interest is that we ensure that Australian workers and particularly Australian young people get the opportunities for training, get the opportunity for skills, get the opportunity for education, get the opportunity to have jobs. And you know, what's happened with our migration program, and I don't think that a lot of people really have quite come to grips with how the migration program has changed. And I think some of the blowback as you call it on Twitter or in the um, in the in the mainstream media came from people who hadn't really quite understood what's happened to our migration program and so I think they read your piece <laughs> well, it's, it's possible some people just read a tweet and then reacted yeah I've heard Maybe. that happens yeah. <laughs> um, but you know 
I think it is important just to spend a minute on this because it's, it's quite significant how much the migration programs change. You know, we used to be a country where people came here permanently. You know, if, we, if people migrated here, they migrated here permanently. They settled down, they raised families, they got jobs, they sent their kids to the schools, they joined their local church you know, or, or a political party. That's how our migration program was structured. And then around the time Howard got elected in 96, it started to shift. And she brought it up. Well, it did start to shift, and it started to shift dramatically yeah. towards um, a, a reliance on temporary migration. So we used to be a country that was built by permanent migrants. We are now an economy that is propped up by temporary migrants. And the shift that has happened, let me just, in 1996, um, there were about 38,000 uh, 38, um, net temporary migrants. That is the, the, the number of who came and went, about 38,000 net temporary migrants, about 55,000 permanent net migrants. Mm. Fast forward to 2018, there's 188,000 net temporary migrants. Just and only, to agree. Yeah, and, all, and, and permanents remained around the same, about 61,000. So really? This, I thought it was way higher. No, this government, this is the great um, scam that Scott Morrison is running on the Australian public. Yeah. He says that he has capped permanent migration at 160,000 migrants a year. So the net is the figure between people who've left Australia and people mm. who come in. Um, he says he is capped at 160,000 permanent migrants a year because, you know, he's heard, quote, the buses are full and the highways are congested. And so he's pitched it as this congestion busting measure. But what he's done is he's allowed temporary migration to just ramp right up. We now have the second highest temporary migrant workforce in the OECD, just behind the United States. You know, we have this burgeoning temporary migrant population and at the same time the government has narrowed their pathways to permanency so it's harder for them to become permanent residents and we have really let business and universities decide who comes into the country. It's no longer the government making that decision. We have let businesses say, you know, hmm, gee, I need to hire a cook. Uh, I look, did a quick look around, I can't find any in Australia, so I'm going to bring one in from overseas, who, by the way, I can pay less, I can use for two years, and then I can just send them home. And so we, we've got a real, you might call it a mercantilist approach to migration, where we are now at risk, serious risk of becoming a guest worker nation. And when you've got a large temporary migra migration um, program, when you've got a large population of temporary migrants, you, know, you have right now in Australia about two million people who are on a temporary visa of some sort or another. They don't have a stake in the long-term future of the country. They are not able to access the same services. And we saw this during COVID when the government has made a decision that people on temporary visas can't have access to job seeker or job keeper, even if they have a job. You know, they don't get access to those things. Um, and they're also vulnerable to exploitation because they can't assert their rights. Um, they can't assert their rights at work because they're vulnerable as temporary migrants. So if you think back to things like the 7-Eleven scandal, you know, you've got a situation where international students can only work 20 hours a week. Their employer gets them into a situation where they get them to work 21 or 22 hours a week and they say, aha, now I've got you. Now you're going to work for less than the award and now you're going to work 30 hours a week but get the same pay. And if you complain, I'm going to report you to Home Affairs and you're gonna get, lose your visa. So it's that temporary status that they've got which makes them quite vulnerable to wage theft, to exploitation, and, and, and in some cases, even worse, sexual or physical abuse. And that's the risk that we run in ramping up temporary migration. And then the last, the most insidious part of it then becomes that once that wage theft and exploitation takes hold in the economy, it becomes the norm. And so when you're bringing in, particularly for young Australians, when our temporary migration program is bringing in largely younger and low-skilled temporary migrants, they're vulnerable to exploitation, abuse, and wage theft. And then that sets in in the economy, that sets in in the work practices. Then the next thing you know, you, know, you or your mates want to get a job at a pub and you find out really it's going to be cash in hand, it's not going to be a proper job, and you're not going to get your superannuation, and you're not going to get your your um, any type of leave and you're not going to be paid by an award rate because if 
the pub doesn't operate that way. It can't compete with the pub down the road that's operating that way. And you just get this flow-on effect. So, you know, my view, we need to get back to being a country that's about permanent settlement, that favors permanent settlement over temporary. We don't want to be a guest worker nation. And we really need to be saying, if there are job vacancies in the country, particularly in areas like cooks and chefs and personal care and, and hospitality, surely there are Australians who can fill those roles. And why aren't they getting the training and the opportunity to do so? Um, that was a pretty comprehensive argument. I was trying to think of ways to puncture holes in it, basically just for more content and like a aha moment. But like, <laughs> dude, I, I can't think of anything. It's just, well, it look, makes too much damn sense. And well, can I add to it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this often happens in media conferences. The journalists just go, yes, Christina, you make so much sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, um, I bet you dream about that. Oh, I do. Um, <laughs> The, well, the other thing I would say is, if you add into it that this liberal government has cut, you know, um, it has cut billions from TAFE and education, yeah. higher education. Yeah. It has, you know, 150,000 apprenticeships and traineeships have been wiped out. You know, once you start taking away the opportunities for skills and training, uh, and basically then outsource to business their capacity to bring in a, a temporary migrant to fill a job, suddenly you start to think, well, that, does that have a relationship to high youth unemployment? I think the well, answer is... Yeah, it, time will it, tell. It would, it would, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and right. that's why I think the most interesting thing about the COVID crisis from a policy perspective, I mean, it's a terrible tragedy, it's a terrible crisis, um, but one of the interesting policy questions is that our borders are shut and we are now going to have to find within ourselves the capacity to fill these jobs that would have been filled by incoming migrants. I mean, we, migration is going to be cut about 30% this year, about 85% next year. So there's going to be people not coming and that's jobs that are going to have to be filled by Australians. And then at some point we're going to restart a migration program. We have never done that in Australian history, just from a standing start in modern Australia, restart a migration program. And it's an opportunity for us to say, you know, do we want to continue on a path that allows um, you know, this blowout in temporary migration where people are exploited, people are underpaid, we become a guest worker nation, you know, we, we, we move away from this image we have of ourselves as a country built by permanent migrants to an economy propped up by temporary exploited migrants that then infects the rest of the workforce. I don't want that for my country. I don't want that for my kids or from the Australia that we live in. Is there, I can't remember what the stat was that you were bringing up. Was it something along the lines of we're getting to the point where it'll be 12% of the population or something yeah, that'll be temporary? Yeah, yeah. so it, it, within a decade, we could have 3 million people. If we continued on the trajectory we were on pre-COVID, we could be on it where 3 million people in Australia have a temporary, are on a temporary visa. You know, and again, I come back to the idea good of... if you own a Hungry Jack, sir. <laughs> oh, you got you're not thinking about it from their perspective, are you? <laughs> well, I'd like to think... <laughs> and that is Australia. I'd like to think that, you know, maybe if you're a teenage kid trying to put yourself through high school or uni, you could get a job at Hungry Jack's, you know, if you're an Australian kid. You know, that's the kind of... I mean, I worked in a fast food place when I went through school. A lot, what was of, it? A lot of people do. Uh, well, it was in America, so it was called... Wendy's or something. Sister's Chicken, which was an offshoot of Wendy's. Mm, I don't think it exists anymore. What a guess. Yeah, right, Okay. But, you know, I know lots of, <laughs> lots of Australians, you know, Jim Chalmers worked at McDonald's growing up in Logan. I mean, that's just how a lot of us put ourselves through high school and uni. And, you know, that's been denied to a lot of Australians now. Um, the, and really? really, I think what's being denied to a lot of young Australians right now is the opportunity to have secure, um, well-paid, award wage work where they're not vulnerable to, you know, exploitation or even to being treated, you know, people... We just saw that recent high court decision where if you're, a ca if you're classified as casual but you've been working as a permanent, you know, they have to make you permanent. Mm. You know, and this is the, the type of exploitation. That, that's a low-level exploitation. That's not wage theft or, well, in some ways it is wage theft. You're taking away people's rights to, to conditions and wages they should have had. You know, it's, it's putting, getting someone, calling them a casual, but then treating them like a permanent. The stability of it, yeah. Yeah, it's, that, it's a loss of stability, a loss of secure, well-paid work. Is there a, I think it was you that was talking about it, something about it made it harder 
to fight the bushfires? Uh, yeah, I mentioned this is, this is, you know, if you have, you know, 5, 10, 12 percent of your population that is not um, able to participate fully in society, how do you engage with them on things that are a risk? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the National Bushfire um, uh, you know, plan that the Commonwealth has says that, so uh, says that um, decisions need to be taken at local, state, and federal level, as well as individuals. And individuals have to be thinking about, you know, things like where they live, having their own personal bushfire emergency plan, what type of work they do, you know, and how they're going to prepare themselves. Now, if you've got this big population of people, some of whom who are working as fruit pickers and, and working in regional areas because that's what the Working Holiday Maker Program asks them to do, go work in regional areas. How do you engage with them? How do you get them, and how can they make some of those decisions? They can't. Um, and so, we, and I, that, you know, I made that um, argument before COVID. I think then COVID just proves the point. We have this global pandemic. We have this national crisis and an emergency. We have circumstances where people are supposed to self-isolate. Um, so, especially if they feel sick. But if you're a temporary visa holder and you can't get access to any government support, um, you can't get home because borders have closed, you can't get home because flight airlines have shut down, and you're stuck here in Australia and you start to feel sick, you're still going to go to work. Mm. You have to mm. because mm. otherwise you don't have money. And if you don't have a job, you're going to go out and look for one. So, you know, when they say we're all in this together, we're not really all in this together. Not everyone in Australia is in this together. And, you know, there's a lot of Australian citizens and permanent residents, you know, ones who are the, a million casuals, um, school teachers, uh, casual teachers, university workers, local government workers. They've been cut out as well of the, a lot of the government support. But temporary visa holders have too. And, you know, the virus doesn't stop and go, hey, are you a temporary visa holder? Okay, I won't infect you, you know, I'll, no. I'll move on to the There's next person. There's still studies on that, but we don't know. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> I, you know, I'm not a doctor, yeah. uh, but I'm pretty confident. No, you're not, that's right. That's yeah, how, you're not right. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. You're right. I mean, the, vi the virus may check visa status. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, uh, I, I think it was Dave Sharma that was talking about this on Q&A. And I can't believe that he's saying that now. But his whole point to you was just like, there was nationalistic jingo in it, which is like, well, what, like I don't, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> look, I'm pissed off that you guys don't have enough flag. That's what I'm angry at. Yeah. So like, that's not nationalistic enough. That's my point. But the second one is, <laughs> yeah, but the tough points. But the second one, he was saying something along the lines of that this is like, why would you be focusing on this during COVID? And you just outlined so perfectly why you should be focusing on this during COVID. Because... When else has Australia had that opportunity? Yeah. Maybe World War II? Mm. Because now it's like, I, there was some stat that was talking about the fact that I think every migrant that Australia accepts in is another $500,000 that yeah. you have to dish out in infrastructure costs. Mm. So yes. it's a huge tax burden to t put this on. Look, I think th there, there are um, costs to migration, but there are also massive benefits. And you know, the, the real question is, who are you bringing in? Like, if you're going to bring in permanent people permanently, so first of all, the government, uh, in some ways, the, this liberal government gets attracted to temporary migrants because, in theory, there's less budget cost to a temporary visa holder, and you can ship them out at the end of their time. Yeah, but and you can also say, like, you know, we made an additional 2% growth this year. Yeah, and look, th there is that mercantilist approach of, you know, relying on... My temporary migrants to um, to boost um, economic activity, but not have to wear any of the cost of having them here. So COVID is the perfect example. You know, you get these people in, you basically take advantage of their labor. But when a crisis hits, you say, "Well, sorry, you're not part of us. Go home, leave." And too bad if you can't go home and you're stuck here. Um, but um, if you think about a permanent migration program, or um, even a long skilled, a, a long term temporary migrant program, like one where you let people come in for five or ten years, um, it's about who you bring in. And you know, the Productivity Commission in 2016 has a great report. Yeah. The government has never responded to it, yeah. ever. Yeah. And it makes the argument that both our economy and our budget would be better off if our migration program focused on younger, 
higher skilled migrants and brought them here permanently. Because, you know, one, they're healthy, they're, they're, they're educated, they can get jobs, but then they generate economic activity. They generate opportunity for other people. They, and, and over their lifetime, they're going, to, they're going to basically produce a lot of economic growth. And because of the, the time in which we got them, they're going to have a less impact on the budget over the course of their lifetime. And so it's that kind of, you know, um, I think that's really interesting. I think it's a really interesting report. It's quite, it's quite thick. It's got a whole lot of other stuff in it that's quite interesting. But you know, this is the government hasn't really engaged in any serious way uh, with the migration program. They've just tinkered at it around the edges. They've created lots of temporary migration opportunities in terms of the working holiday maker program, um, changes to temporary skilled visas. The other thing, though, that they've done, which I don't think a lot of people quite appreciate either, is they've really lost control of the, um, the application processing. So um, for example, there are um, spouse visas, partner visas. So if you're an Australian and you, you fall in love with a foreign person and you want to bring them here, and you, that's meant to be demand driven. It's meant to be basically, if you qualify as an Australian and you've got this genuine relationship, that person's meant to be able to get a visa and come here. Um, there's a 90,000 person waiting list for spouse visas, for partner visas. So yeah. that's insane. Like an iPhone. It's, in, it's mad. Like yeah. There's 125,000 people who are waiting to take their citizenship pledge. You know, really? It's, yeah, there's 125,000 people. There's two federal electorates you know, that, that could have voted. Um, it's, it's just extraordinary, the blowout that they've had. And then you add to it, the what other thing- What do you think there's a reason for that? Why is it happening? Um, well, my take on it is that the, um, the government under Turnbull, when they created the Department of Home Affairs, they brought together all these different agencies, so immigration, um, and then a lot of the security agencies, you know, AFP, ASIO, um, Australian Border Force, and in that amalgamation, which could, be a, could have been a success, I would argue that it hasn't been a great rip-roaring success to date, yet may well prove to be, but in that, you know, the immigration department was always two sides of one coin. It was about who you bring in and how you welcome them into the country, how you integrate them in. And then it's also about who you, do, who you don't let in and the decisions you take to keep people out. And I would argue that with the creation of the Department of Home Affairs, you saw a real securitization of immigration. That is, it became very focused on what are the risks? Who do we not let in? And so there, there were all these different barriers put in place of people being able to join us permanently. The English test, language tests got harder. Um, the, the, the amount of time you had to wait to qualify got longer. Um, that the points at which you had to take different types of assessments, there, there became more points in the process. And so, the party of red tape well, because, created yeah. heaps of red tape. Well, it created heaps of red tape with a, with a uh, you know, which you can say is an admirable view about, you know, not wanting to keep us safe. But I think there was a tip away from, a tip, a real securitization of the idea that the, everyone coming presents a potential risk uh, and has to be um, to, and, and away from what are the economic benefits of migration, what are the cultural benefits of migration, um, and who do we bring in and how do we integrate them in. Right. And so there's nobody at the cabinet table right now, at, at, the, at the cabinet table, who represents immigration as a economic tool. Now immigration, as we've just talked about, is a massive economic tool. But the only person at the cabinet table under the Morrison government who talks about immigration is Peter Dutton, and he does it from a securitization perspective. And that you know, is really what has been has been lacking in the government's thinking, I would argue, s since they created the Department of Home Affairs, that understanding of migration and the importance it plays culturally and economically. Are you scared of overpopulation, or do you think that's not a problem? I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not scared of overpopulation. I mean, I'm not scared of many I am. Things. I don't want to live in Blade Runner. <laughs> well, no one's but asking you. You basically do, don't you? This building <laughs> is that. <laughs> But 2049, not the original. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, yeah, dude, it is. <laughs> um, uh, I, I get enough adrenaline in my own day-to-day -day life. I don't. <laughs> you don't need to see. Okay, right. Um, mm. Now, but 
Look, I mean, the whole, I lived through the whole Paul, you know, the Ehrlichson view of the world that we were all going to, you know, perish. And, um, you know, I do, I do think, one, I think human ingenuity, uh, we, we will be able to come up with ways to manage. Oh, that has to be a tipping point. Come on. Like sure, surely, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not saying that there's no no point at which we 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 don't pose a real risk. And I would argue that our failure to act on climate change as a as a globe and as a country is you know shows that at times human ingenuity has failed us because yeah. we haven't actually faced a clear and pressing um, danger to the planet. Yeah. Uh, but that's your fault, the voter. Mm. But anyway, no, sorry, I, sorry that they're so rude to you, Christine. No, <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> um, but. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I think Australia and um, and I don't want to get into these debates about big Australia because I think people just use that term to mean whatever they think it means. It's not a real term. I mean, well, I don't know term. either. I just, yeah, I just exactly. like when I see, I just think that you know, Australia doesn't have much water, mm. and so just these kind of things. You or are just talking like to the person who turned on the suburbs. desalination plant in New South Wales. Yeah, Park. push the button. Hell yeah! Did Drink you? the first glass of water. Yes. Did you have to cut a ribbon, or was it just no, the I button? No, I literally just the... pushed a button. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it, we, we designed a, you know, a. Did it break a down? Very sim- or? No, it worked fine. <laughs> well, that's great. It great fine. to hear. Yeah. Yes, it did. That's amazing. I can't believe it. I just got to say that just while I'm venting about it. I can't believe that New South Wales lives. See, now, look, any chance to dump on them, but like, <laughs> damn, I cannot believe that they fought you tooth and nail to not open that. Wasn't that the whole like yeah. argument at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I think you can find at the time that you know, at state politics particularly, um, the New South Wales Libs will find any uh, convenient uh, opportunity to oppose. So, for example, I remember Barry O'Farrell standing up. You remember Barry O'Farrell? Oh um, yeah. Yeah. He was, Mr. I stepped yes. down for some wine, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Making it nearly Sounds impossible plausible. for me to go into a wine shop for the next ten years <laughs> without some you know smart ass. You know, assistant yeah, in the no, wine shop going, true. oh, Premier, the uh, <laughs> Grange is over here. And I'd be like, yeah. Grant, wrong. hide the bottle yeah, of wine yeah, we got I for yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> Did you buy me a bottle of wine? No, we didn't. Oh, we didn't. didn't. Sorry. No. I was born <laughs> in 1968. <laughs> and that's it. That was because, remember, he got the bottle of Grange from the year of his birth. That yeah. Was um, so, uh, but I remember him standing up in Parliament saying that, you know, the, um, the Liberals would never allow mining anywhere in New South Wales where there was a water catchment. Now, first of all, most of the state is a water catchment. But secondly, um, he was talking specifically about um, a mine up in Wyong, Walla Ratu, that we were, we hadn't even given approval to, like, but he was running this ferocious campaign, stood up with t-shirts, you know, no Walla Ratu. Of course, what have the New South Wales Liberals done? They've approved it, you know, like, consistency is not exactly, um, no, it's uh, not their forte. Not their forte. No. 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 Um, sorry, I, I will just keep talking to you about that. Just being like, which parliament do you like more? So I guess we'll just ask like about Peter Dutton. Actually, come on. Now that I've asked it, which one do you like more? Like the design of? Well, <laughs> I don't think it's a case of which one I, I like more or less. Um, they're very different jobs. They are incredibly no, different no, no, jobs. No, 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 no. We're just talking pure aesthetics here. Oh, pure which, aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely the federal parliament. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I know, that scary CCTV camera they have on you guys in state. What is that? Uh, is there the, such a thing as a close-up in there? So I, I, I will say I like the state, the Legislative Assembly chamber insofar that it's historic and it's, um, it, it, it has, it's quite close, like it's quite small. And so you were like, there's a, I remember one point when I was Premier, um, Gladys Berejiklian, when she was Shadow Transport, was waving some document around and claiming there was something wasn't in it. And I just walked around to her and took it out of her hand and <laughs> turned to the page and said, there it is, and handed it back. <laughs> like, it's that close you can do that. I was technically out of order, but, um, you know, so there is something about the closeness <laughs> of it um, and, the, and the history of it. But just as a building, it's dark. It's, it's the worst of, ni- of like a, a 1960s, 70s architecture. It's, 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 it's hard to get fresh air. It's, it's, it's kind of true. Every time I go to Canberra and you walk past Parliament, you think, wow. It is and Every time building. I walk past that Parliament, I'm just like, is this under construction? Or, like, <laughs> well, the problem is you've got the, the, the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Council, but then you've got the new bit, which is where all the offices are, and they were just, they're just terrible. It's like, <laughs> at one point when I was in government, right, we looked at whether or not you could 
basically knock it down and rebuild it, but you would have been restricted on height because of the domain and you would have had a fight with the city of city council and you know, just like, was like, wow. Well, Too much of a headache. You, and you got decent limitation plans you to got, build. You got to pick your battles and you know, that wasn't one I was really keen to have. Yeah, but fair, fair. At some point someone will have to rebuild it. It's not fit for purpose. Like it's, it's old. It was built before the internet. So like the wiring is a big issue in that chamber, in that building. You can imagine well, so the amount of So it was just time, for the little monogram or whatever it's called. Yeah, well, you can imagine the amount of times it's been rewired since it's and it had more wiring put in since it was built. It, it's quite a... Yeah, mm. that's where Malcolm Turnbull got his broadband plan from. Yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, right, you get angry at Peter Dutton frequently. Oh, I don't get angry at him. I just like to hold him to account. Well, in, I'm a, disappointed, in a cordial but in, way. In a cordial <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it is federal politics. You, know, yeah. you have to... Uh, well, I've actually never point. seen you lose your temper. Maybe you do. But every time I've ever seen you on the news or whatever... <laughs> Sorry, one of, my, one, like, of my, oh, one of my offspring nice. is in the back room. Maybe he can... <laughs> Does she? <laughs> <laughs> he just nodded. <laughs> Are you supposed to go to a pub? <laughs> Jeez. Make your mum look bad like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you're, uh, why, why don't you like Peter Dutton? What's wrong with you? <laughs> why, well, look, uh, the guy's incompetent. Yeah, he is an incompetent home affairs minister. And he was an incompetent health minister before that. You know, he, he was voted the worst health minister in 35 years by Australian doctors, you know. <laughs> like, mm. um, but as, a, as um, you know, where can we begin on his incompetence as Home Affairs Minister? I mean, we can start with the Ruby Princess. Uh, we can talk about the Bilawila family. We can talk about all the people um, who've been languishing on Manus in Nauru uh, while third party countries have been willing to take them and he's turned them down. You know, we can talk about, we have talked about the blowouts and citizenship processing and partner visas. Um, you know, the, the, the blowout in temporary migration, the exploitation of people. Here, I'll give you an, an example. Uh, you know, Peter Dutton likes to get up and, you know, talk about stopping the boats, right? And, you know, go on about refugees. Under his watch, under his watch, he has failed to notice that the people smugglers have switched their business model from boats to planes. I heard about this. Yes. So what? Fill us in. So what is ha what what now happens? Yeah. Is that organized criminal syndicates get people mainly from China and Malaysia? Yeah. Although some of the folks from Malaysia may have come from other countries and gotten a Malaysian identity card. They get a tourist visa to come to Australia. And then once they're here, they, so they organize for these people to get a tourist visa and come to Australia as tourists. And then once they're here, they apply for asylum. And they're applying for asylum not Smart because... Smart process, I've got to say. Yeah. Well, they're applying for asylum not because they are seeking asylum, but because the processing time to assess an asylum claim in Australia has blown out to about three to five years. That's about how long it takes to determine an asylum claim. What was it under the Gillard government again? Oh, it, was, yeah. uh, it was much shorter. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, we, in fact, went to the election with a 90-day rule that we would seek to have them determine within 90 days. Mm. So they've blown this out, you know, three to five years, depending on how long you can go with appeals. Some people can go on an appeals for, you know, up to a decade. And the thing is you have work rights when you are on you put on a bridging visa, which is basically, people may have heard the phrase bridging visa. It's a visa you have when you're moving, trying to move from one type of visa to another. And when, when we were last, when Labor was last in government, there were probably about, a hundred, I think it was about 100, 125,000 bridging visas, and that's usually what it was around a churn. Mm. Now there's 300,000 bridging visas in Australia. I mean, that, <laughs> that is like a symbol of an immigration system. That's like a symptom of a sickness, like a total yeah. breakdown Where of the immigration system. Shortly, Peter Dutton's incompetent. So he is incompetent. Clearly. So, but this is the point. Like, so these people, they get trafficked here. They get made to apply for asylum. A lot of them don't even know they're applying for asylum. They just think they're, they're being told they have to sign this paperwork. And really? then they get to stay here for three to five years with work rights. It's a work scam. And many of them are then trafficked into work, you know, whether it's fruit picking, whether it's beauty salons, whether it's 
you know, sex work, you know, they're, they're effectively, you know, we, we've had horror stories. We've done these round tables around the country. You know, their passports get taken and held by the labor hire company they get trafficked out to. They're getting paid, you know, they might get paid $8 an hour, but then they're, or $8 a day sometimes, but then they're charged $4 for their accommodation. Like, it's a, it is a work scam and it's a, it's a golden opportunity for exploitation. Um, because these people are essentially, um, they've often paid money to a trafficker to get them out here for this, this work. They've sometimes been told they're getting a work visa when they get here. Um, what so Peter there's 100,000 people who have applied for asylum under Peter Dutton's watch. 100,000 people have come to Australia, applied for asylum under Peter Dutton's watch. That is double the number of people who came by boat under labor. Mm. And of those 100,000 people, or of the ones, of that, those airplane, they call them uh, you know, onshore arrivals, of those onshore arrivals who've applied for asylum, to date, about 90% of them have been found not to be refugees. Mm. So, I mean, I make the point that applying for asylum is an important legal right. And, you know, there are genuinely cases of people who come here and apply for asylum. But this blowout... Yeah, nine out of ten times it's not. It's not. It's a work scam, and it's coming largely from two places. And, you know, this has happened before in the past, and immigration has been on top of it, and they've gone in and disrupted it. That hasn't happened here. They've turned a blind eye because, you know, all Peter Dutton wants to talk about is boats. He doesn't want to talk about the fact that this, you know, airplane arrivals has blown out on his watch. Um, so when he says, we stop the boats, essentially what he's saying is, we have made mobsters' business model better. <laughs> we've, we've allowed them to shift to airplanes, but don't notice that. Don't look at that. You, know. you don't hear that in the Telegraph. <laughs> no. You don't, though. Well, you don't. They, you don't. It, like, that was just like basically every front page for yep. months was well, about the 50,000 boats. You know, and, and uh, Dutton always goes to boats when he wants to either distract or he wants to whip up fear and hysteria. He goes to boats. Um, but, you know, he missed the one big boat that mattered. You know, the Ruby Princess sails in through <laughs> Sydney Harbour, you know, coronavirus on board. And, you know, I think it's important for people to understand this because you'll you hear the federal government say, oh, you know, it's New South Wales Health, it's New South Wales Health. Now, New South Wales Health does have some responsibility, but it has it under the Federal Biosecurity Act. So... Don't know what that means. So there is a Federal Biosecurity Act. Uh -huh. I'm learning. And, it, and there is a Federal Biosecurity Officer. It is the Chief Health Officer of the Commonwealth, Brendan Murphy. He's a guy we've seen a lot yeah, of the yeah, last yeah, few yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. He is also the Chief Federal Biosecurity Officer. And under the Biosecurity Act, all arriving planes and boats have to tick off these biosecurity forms that they have no illness on board, no human illness, no contagions on board, contagious passengers, etc. Now, under the Federal Biosecurity Act, the Federal Health um, the federal uh, biosecurity officer delegates to state health offices to do to check the forms essentially. Mm. So yes, New South Wales Health has some responsibility, but it's a delegated authority under the federal law. They operate under federal authority, and four days before the Ruby Princess arrived, the prime minister stood up in a media conference at a, pl a podium like this and said that arriving cruise ships would be under the direct command of the Australian Border Force. So four days before the Ruby Princess arrived, the Prime Minister announces to the country, arriving cruise ships are under the direct command of the Australian Border Force, which of course reports to Peter Dutton, the Australian Border Force. Ruby Princess sails into Sydney Harbour. Does the Australian Border Force do anything differently? No. Does, you know, Federal Department of Agriculture got human health reports saying, no, oh, we've had some flu-like symptoms on board. Do they do anything differently? No. Does anything happen? No, just 2,700 people under, you know, federal law are ushered off the Ruby Princess. You know, and now it's 850 coronavirus cases, um, over 30 deaths, 10% of all coronavirus cases can be linked in Australia, can be linked back to the Ruby Princess. What do they say when you raise that? Who's they? The, you know, them, the government oh you know they guy next door oh you know they don't want to point fingers like that's their best they can come up with they don't want to point fingers and there's an inquiry underway in new south wales there's always you know. an inquiry yeah yeah get to the goddamn well, action 
Well, I, you know, I don't, we haven't heard the prime minister's, you know, he said we're not going to get everything right. Well, this is terrible. Like, this is death. <laughs> These are 30 people who died. Like, I, I think Australian ah. people, the Australian people should be able to rely on their Australian border force and the Commonwealth government at a minimum to keep them safe. Mm. You know, they should be able to trust them with their health and their lives. And so we haven't had an apology uh, from Scott Morrison. We haven't had an apology from Peter Dutton. You know, they've tried to blame everyone else. No, you know, suddenly a boat arrives and it's not their responsibility. I mean, Scott Morrison has a bloody trophy in his office of a boat. And it says on it, I stopped these. <laughs> it's like, Ruby Princess, mate, you missed the one big boat that yeah. mattered. The one big boat that mattered. And you knew it was coming. I mean, seriously, yeah. they knew it was coming. Think about this. The Ruby Princess was a month after the Diamond Princess. The Diamond Princess was the one that got quarantined in Japan. W uh. And there were 16 Australians on board. It was quarantined for weeks. You know, we knew a month earlier that cruise ships presented a particular um, risk with coronavirus. I think we knew that as soon as cruise ships were invented. Well, yeah. Um, I think... That may be the case, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> Had some parties on there. <laughs> uh, but the point is, that's why the Prime Minister stood up and made this big, you know, you know Scotty from marketing announcement. You yeah. know, we're going to put arriving cruise ships under the direct command of Australian Border Force. And then four days later, the Ruby Princess shows up and nothing different happens. These people are just allowed to just get right off without a temperature check or a um, face mask or anything and then spread out across the country. So really, they were responsible also for the, I can't even remember the name of the cruise ship, but the one in WA. Oh, the Ar Artemia, I think it was. They were responsible for that. And yeah. so Mark McGowan had to actually just step in and say, no, we're not letting that in. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think he learned from the Ruby Princess. Right. Don't trust these guys. <laughs> all right, all right. Dish some more heat on Dutton. What else mm. have you got for us? Well, there is so much to talk about. <laughs> I mean, what do you want to do? Do you want to... We're only five minutes already. No, top five. Ah, right. Is this direction? This is like editorial direction. Yeah, this is your talk about the buses sign in oh, the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is that. <laughs> that I didn't even have a sign. I got a <laughs> hand. It was. It was <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, you might get some sponsors. Maybe you can afford some paper later. And no, that's not going to happen. Design. Okay. No. All right. That's. Not going to happen. Okay. I uh, I swear a lot. Okay. Um, what, was, what was the direction? The direction five. was something about five. five. Talk about your top five <laughs> things that you don't like about Dutton. Well, I, I'm happy to do this, but I, I want to say like up front. Happy though. to do it. I'm happy to do it. Yep. Um, but I do want to make clear because some people, I think, um, you know, might misinterpret this section of the interview. Like I'm always one in politics that has taken the view, at least I try to, to play the ball, not the player. You know, so, um, you know, I don't try to get into where people, you know, their physical characteristics or, you know, where they've come from. Or I think all that, you know, I had plenty of that when I was Premier thrown at me. Yeah. And, um, for example, the New South Wales Liberal Party did a great little uh, ad where they had a woman dressed up as me with the blonde flicky hair and, and you know, in my accent, making, you know, trying to mock me. And I, you know, it's still up there on their on their New South Wales Liberal Yeah, but look, website. you can take the joke. I can take the yeah. joke, but I also don't think that's really what politics should be about. Like, it's not about personality and attacking a person. Ah, it's we have about, strong philosophical differences. Well, there. we might, but uh, <laughs> that's just the view I've taken in politics. Right, uh, and, and I respect so, that. <laughs> so I want to critique Peter Dutton on the things that he has done, is my main. All right, so, we're going to have to cut this interview short then, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> but yeah, you well, you're going to miss some really... Uh, <laughs> and look, I, I mean, I did talk about the fact that he has, uh, you know, one, um, allowed, you know, hundreds of people to languish on Manus and Nauru when there were third-party countries like New Zealand that were willing to take them. Mm. You know, he has allowed what is meant to be uh, temporary um, regional processing to become indefinite detention. It's cruel. He's using these people as a human warning system and there were options for their permanent resettlement. Look, in all honesty, if he was keen bit, yeah. to get people off Manus and Nauru, he would accept New Zealand's offer. Yeah, He true. would accept it. Um, so I give credit to the, to the Turnbull government for accepting the, getting the US deal done. About 700 people have gone there, but there are still about 400 people on Manus and Nauru. 
Plus there are people here in Australia who came from Manus and Nauru for medical treatment, not through medevac, most of them transferred by the government. Um, and he has not taken up any third party country options like New Zealand. So he's let them just languish indefinitely. Um, I would say the second thing, I can't go past him turning, well, boycotting the apology to the stolen generation in 2008. He actually boycotted it in the parliament. What does boycott mean? Like he like walked out on it. So he was in parliament and he walked out? Yeah, yeah. Kevin Rudd's giving the apology and he leaves. Yeah. Man of symbolism. Yeah. Um, um, what else you got? Uh, his, his treatment of the Biloela family uh, is pretty, pretty rotten. You know, this is this family, this Sri Lankan family from Biloela, Queensland, you know, who, um, uh, they're, they're, the Biloela community wanted them to be able to stay in Australia. Uh, and their claims for asylum had been denied. Um, their, their family, the, their community wanted them to stay. Their National Party MP wanted them to stay. Alan Jones and Barnaby Joyce were campaigning for them to stay. These are people who like, had come here, had been here for almost a decade, had two children born here, you know, had gotten jobs, were volunteering in the local community. Um, and they, were, they sent border force in early hours of the morning to basically raid the home and take them out. And now they're living on Christmas Island alone you know, in a in the Christmas Island facility, uh, while the High Court hears um, the case for their youngest child, who the lawyers have argued her claim has never been assessed. But there was no need for them to be bundled out in that way, and there was no need for the local community to be so disregarded. You know, back to my point about we're a country of permanent migration and people being able to settle here and become part of the Australian story. Um, this is a situation where the community wanted them to stay. And, and felt like they had settled here. And, and the way he has treated that, that family, I think, has been callous. Um, I, you know, he may like feeling, he may like the idea of, of looking callous, um, but, you know, immigration ministers have, as one former immigration minister said, almost godlike powers over human beings' lives. And I think in that case, it was exercised quite poorly. Um, uh, you know, you, you, so that, that, that's two. Um, I think the, um, uh, the way that he uses um, boats to whip up fear, but yet at the same time cut patrols prior to the May 2019 election. What was that about? Over budget or? Uh, yeah, there was claims that they were, um, they had, well, they, ha they had a budget cut mm. and then the number of patrols actually did dip. Um, and not only that, we have this future maritime surveillance capacity program uh, that is now a couple years behind schedule. You know, so we should be using all kinds of more advanced technology, drones and sonar and things, and we're still basically sending planes out to patrol. Um, planes will always need planes, but there should be a whole lot of other technology that we should be using. So you know, he, he has both um, you know, relied on people's fear of, of um, you know, boats coming from the north, but yet not, at times pulled, pulled back patrols or not invested in the patrol capacity. And, you know, I'd make the point that the only time a boat has actually landed in Australia under Peter Dutton's watch, um, despite all his fear mongering about it, is the week, the very week he challenged Malcolm Turnbull for the prime ministership. I mean, talk about taking your eye off the ball. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a real fun one. I, yeah, I mentioned that him. is, isn't yeah. it? Because okay, so essentially all it is is just a marketing tactic. Yeah, he's, he's the a, fact that I know you don't he, like he, this, but he just looks very stern and scary, and so that's basically well, all it know, is. Is I just that. I think he's gotten like, away mm. with that for a while, and I think now his incompetence is coming home to roost. I mean, you can't turn away from the the figures I've just cited. You know, the hundred thousand asylum claims on shore, the, the blowout in bridging visas to 300,000, the 90,000 wait list for partner visas, 125,000 people you know, um, waiting for citizenship, um, you know, the failures to invest in our maritime surveillance capacity. You know, I, I, you know, I think that was up to three. Four, I, men I mentioned earlier, he was voted the worst health minister um, of all time. Uh, well, it speaks for itself. I think it is, and you know, people forget he was Who the was the other guy that was before that that got the before health? him, that was oh, the was second it, worst or whatever. Was it, uh, was it Abbott? Oh, Tony Abbott was health minister. We did have the Tony Abbott. That was with the glorious years. Yeah, so he Howard got silver. 
Yeah, hey. He got silver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're into basketball. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so uh, that, that, um, you know, that, that real, his incompetence isn't new in the Department of Home Affairs. It's mm. followed him. Mm. Uh, and then I think, you know, I mentioned earlier about the Department of Home Affairs. Um, there was a survey out last year. You know, he's the guy who's meant to be leading this brand spanking new Malcolm Turnbull created department that brings all our agencies together. And last year, the there was a survey of the public sector agencies. Home Affairs ranked dead bottom for um, morale. It was ranked last out of all public sector agencies. <laughs> Morale. Dead last for morale, and a third of the people in the Department of Home Affairs said they wanted to work somewhere else. It's not a happy place. It's not a happy place. Did they list Dutton, or was it kind of just like reasons undisclosed? <laughs> I suppose, yeah, you, you can't, can you? <laughs> Bureaucrats just have to shut up, don't they? That's pretty much it. And they just kind of just have these like little vague... You know, it's I, interesting I you say that because you know, we have this great thing in the Senate called Senate estimates, right? And Go bureaucrats on. are meant to give frank and fearless advice to the, to the government, and they're meant to give frank and fearless answers in the Senate estimates. What we've seen under Morrison in particular is an approach in Senate estimates, which is to take as many things on notice, questions on notice. So if I, and things they should know, like I might say, for example, tell me how many people work in the Department of Home Affairs and they'll go, well, we'll take that on notice, Senator. And it's like, you can answer that right now. <laughs> you know, and it's about taking as much as possible on notice mm. so that you don't, the government never looks bad in Senate estimates. Right, right, and, right. Um, so it's this, and, and Morrison gave a speech last year about the public, to the public service, where he essentially said to them, we're not interested in your ideas. We're going to yeah. tell you what to do yeah. and you just implement it. And it's yes, like, yes. one of the great things about Australia is we have a really solid public service. I mean, it was one of the things I, you know, n know from my time in New South Wales, and it's one of the things we have got federally. Um, great public servants. And, you know, to say to the public service, we're not interested in your ideas, just shut up and implement what we tell you to do, that's, that's, that's a really short-sighted way to run government. Yeah. Mm. So he's basically saying, I can run government with like 12 people. Pretty much, or just him. Actually, Scott Morrison. Just him. Actually, Scott <laughs> Morrison. Ambitious. You gotta no, no, like it. No, he has a special committee of cabinet, which constitutes a meeting of cabinet, and he is the only member of it. <laughs> <laughs> what an exclusive club! Would you <sighs> like to be that? You could take attendance, and you know, you could just do it all right there. Make decisions. No one. Will, I wonder if he argues with himself. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Does he? It's like, man. I'm so glad that you dish all this stuff. Uh, now we're getting the wrap up. Oh, we should have just done this. Just tell us what you know about Scott Morrison's personal life, the interview. <laughs> I don't know anything about his personal life. Well, it seems just like he's just, just like and in his office. You can get this. You know? well, he's, he poses for photos with it in his office. You know, I I, I want to buy him for Christmas like a, a little model ruby princess. I told my office, see if we can buy. You can buy them a little model ruby princess. I was going to send. Do it. it. I was going to send it. it to him. You didn't stop this one. Oh come on! All right, come on, guys. We're right. crowdfunding mm -hmm. that. Uh, Actually, you, you do you need, need it. What were they? Were they were expensive? Those. $450. Maybe not. <laughs> it's not worth the chuck. I want to be cheaper than that. Anyway. I did too. That's why yeah, I, right. I You the stopped idea. as well? If I got $450, I'd rather give it to a charity or something. I'll give them to the Asylum Seeker Resource Center. I'm going to be honest, I'd rather the boat. But that's very nice of you to say that. that <laughs> good on you. It's so too, come on, it's too good of a laugh. Um, and you isn't that its own medicine? Hmm? You do move around a lot. A lot. And I, and I was really conscious of it this time. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. How nice are Kevin Rudd and Jodie McKay for not mentioning that? <laughs> it's well known that I'm not as nice as they are. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> it's very nice of you. Uh, uncharacteristically nice of you. Mm. And I really appreciate the sit down and just uh, informing everybody of those uh, pressing matters. Mm. Mm. Thanks for your time. I've got nothing else to do. All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, thank you. And I guess we'll just. The right. lights just cut out. I think that's a wrap. Damn.
please share and comment below. Come in.